dunes uh, come in a variety of types and are formed in a variety of places uh, where basically the sediment is sand sized, that's like millimeters or sub-millimeter size, and it's free, totally free of vegetation or soil to hold it together. So this could be a desert, it can be a shoreline, it can be, in this case, a coast where we have an abundant sand supply making up the New Jersey coastline. If you just had the beach with no dunes at all and let Mother Nature have its course, every year there'd be a series of northeast storms which would wash debris, plant material, and other junk to a particular distance inland along in a relatively straight line on this beach. Well, in that debris are seeds of pioneer plants, and plants would then start growing the following season, and the wind blowing the sand, which is loose, and the wind can transport sand easily, it collects around the plants. And since the debris is in a line, the plants are in a line, therefore at this position, unless it gets overrun by a bigger storm the next year, pushing it further landward, uh, you end up with what's called the primary dune. And so this feature starts out small, foot, two foot high, spaced irregularly, but in a basic line. And over time, it grows larger. These pioneer plants are added to by new plants that are either brought in by birds or come in by the storms. And you end up with a variety of species common to this part of the world, uh, which colonize the dune because they can. So basically they're a natural process that has a timeline of between 20 and 50 years to become mature in terms of its size, width, elevation, and plant distribution on them. Um, some of which you can still find in New Jersey on the natural beaches like Island Beach State Park or Little Beach Island uh, where these dunes are 100 or so years old. Starting, I would say, probably the mid-1970s, it became obvious to coastal managers and others that uh, the dune was the final barrier to storm wave attack at some level of intensity. The bigger the dune, the better it seemed to work. The use of fencing and then artificially bringing in the plants that are grown today in nurseries, uh, particularly American beach grass, sea oats, uh, a number of other kinds of plants, uh, then are planted deliberately to colonize and start a dune. And very often there is a design cross section in terms of the dune's height, the dune's width at its base, its seaward and landward slopes, and its position relative to high tide. So the dune is then designed to fit in with a restored beach system that gets built. With or without the beach fill, dunes have been added to the landscape a lot since 1980. There's been no record of any major beach nourishment project in Northern Ocean County. The dunes and beach widths were fairly small except for Jenkins Beach and uh, Point Pleasant Beach. So the waves got to the dunes right away. And as a result, in spite of having some dunes over 22 feet high, uh, they were mined away literally by the scouring of the waves and breaching occurred in many, many, many places. And we have found that over 600,000 cubic yards of sand was stripped off of the beaches and dune system into Barnegat Bay, onto the streets and roads and lots, and washed back out to sea. Something clearly has to happen in Northern Ocean County to do a lot of restoration down through Ortley Beach, La Valette. The uh, uh, little community of Midway Beach had done a very good job of building a dune naturally, more or less, enhancing it with the snow fencing and everything else, and so they actually survived pretty well. It's been a blue collar community for years, and I think the older generations of people, the people that have spent you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 summers here, they have appreciation of what the potential the ocean can do to their property. So that long, deep-rooted history kind of takes into the, de develops the culture of Midway. So ultimately, you have the majority of the people understanding the importance of the dunes. Right after Sandy, we had a couple of residents who had lost some trees in front of her house and they were like, hey, can we bring them down to help restore the dunes? This is really early on, right after Sandy. Um, so they brought their treetops down and we put them in a dune fence and this is one of them. 
And you can see already it started to fill in uh, with sand since in probably about a month we had three storms. And uh, you can see it's already getting buried. And the, the dune fence helps as well, but uh, the dune fence with the trees actually works better. They work together. You know, when we look at the beach and we look at the dune, uh, the whole watershed, barrier island, estuary is a system. But here especially, when you look offshore and you see the sandbar that leads into the beach, into the dune face, into the back part of it, that whole system functions together. The dune lends sand to the beach and the sandbar lends sand to the beach. And it works as one unit. When you break up any piece of that unit, it's not going to function naturally. So when, when the winter comes and the, and the sandbar's out there, it's protecting itself. Really in nature, it's saying, I'm protecting the estuary. That's what that sandbar is saying. I want to protect my dune system and my estuary because that's what it has naturally. But you want to have what nature says works here. So you can see some different species in that, what's left of that dune. So when you look at that profile, that creates like a mat that helps against um, the, the storm surge. And um, you know, just dune grass planting isn't going to do that for us, but it's a good first start. Basically, if we say we're going to put some uplands here above sea level, and then we have a beach, and this comes down, uh, we have you know the water out here. Here's your water level. Call this high tide. All right, the waves run up this beach, and we you know put uh, a house here. <laughs> uh, put the house there. At some point, the waves stop, and where they stop, they leave a little pile of debris. And over time, this little pile of debris accumulates sand until you end up with the primary dune. And there you go. That's basically, this happens in a line parallel to the shoreline. All right, well, if the beach erodes away and this disappears and you end up back here, then it's closer to the dune. And you end up with a cut in the dune after a storm and erosion is a problem. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers comes along and says, well, we have a design for a new beach. We'll use your existing dune, but we're going up, over, and then back down, and we're going to move the beach out to a new position, and this new material becomes the beach nourishment project. And so this then is the replacement. And so we we'll get rid of the water now. This is all dry land, and we have this 100 foot wide beach here. We have a 22 foot high dune and 100 feet in width. And then another almost 100 feet to the high tide line because this is sloping from an elevation of about six down to an elevation of about three. So this then becomes the beach nourishment project, which then, of course, these folks here complain they can't see the ocean anymore because it blocks their view. But now the house doesn't disappear in a Hurricane Sandy uh, because this thing does really work. Now you have to maintain it. This is like painting the house or paving the streets. If you never pave the street, eventually you get potholes and other problems that result, which become a problem. So these, the, the, this sand is distributed. It's loose. It's just sand. And so the dynamic equilibrium between the waves, the tides, the storms, and the wave approach directions all move this sand along the Jersey coast. The barrier islands got built by this dynamic equilibrium. And we're just saying, we want this little piece of real estate to stay there forever. And it's on a piece of real estate that doesn't stay anywhere forever. So to the extent that we can keep this mythology of permanence going, we can build these beach fills and it extends our time under the sun. <laughs>